Good morning and welcome to a special edition of StarCast from Planet Waves. My name is Eric Francis Coppolino, counseling astrologer, author of the Planet Waves Horoscope, and host of Planet Waves FM, coming to you from a bright, beautiful, sunny, high-pressure day here in Kingston, New York, in the mid-Hudson Valley of New York State, a little bit north of the city, well, about 100 miles, a little bit south of Albany, about 45 miles, right on the Hudson River. It's good to be with you, wherever you may be in the world, in the future, or in your state of mind. I'm here today to talk about the eclipse of the sun that takes place on October the 14th. That should be Saturday at 1.55 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, So that is in a little bit less than one week, though uh, with an eclipse, the orb of influence and time can be quite wide, uh, and we are definitely in the vortex. We are circling this eclipse right now. And there are things about eclipses that it is good to know, uh, to work with them. They are one of the most workable things in all of astrology, you know, you might want to set intentions at the new moon or, you know, have an idea about what an aspect is about. But but an eclipse is an, another kind of thing. It's somewhat next level. Uh, an eclipse is a, a lineup of multiple objects and points on different dimensions of space and time. So it reaches further out into space and time and into the human realm than most astrological events. And it's why we feel them so strongly and why I think it's so necessary to to work with them consciously. They were one of the very first things I discovered in in astrology, one of the first, I think, probably right up there with Chiron, even before Chiron, actually, I was working with eclipses and sussing them out as essentially as growth tools as, as psychic tools uh, to gain leverage over uh, the affairs of your life and in that place where your life meets the world, right? That's one of those things that eclipses uh, talk about is this, uh, this an intersection of environments, personal and collective. That is a general property of the lunar nodes. People often wonder what these things are about. The lunar nodes, which point to where eclipses are going to happen, or are happening now, uh, are personal points. They're, they're every bit as personal as uh, your part of fortune, your ascendant, your midheaven, your sun, your moon. They, they move more slowly than any of those things, but nonetheless, they are, uh, they are about something specific about your life, indeed many things specific. Uh, I started writing about them in the late 1990s, and whenever I uh, come to one of these articles uh, from 1998 or 1999, I get a glimpse of the pre-9-11 world, a world that has fallen down the memory hole for most people. There is no recollection. It seems so long ago so so many people that we know weren't even born at that point. If you happen to know young people, well, I mean, a, a lot of them were either very little or not born yet at the time of 9-11. It was a different world. Yes, it was chaotic. Yes, there was this sense of uh, rapid movement. Yes, there was this sense of standing on the brink of the unknown, much uncertainty and all of that. But the difference was that it was not as paranoid. There was not this sense of impending doom. And more than anything, there was a sense that uh, improving the world was possible. And right now we're living in a world where it seems like there's never, ever a solution to a problem. There's only a new iPhone. There's only some new Lexus. That's the supposed supposed solution to anyone's problem is some new technological device, which is really based on the same technology that's been, you know, bumbling around. It's just shinier. Maybe it's quicker. Maybe it has more features. 
That's all we get in the way of improvement. Think of any problem in the world that you have known about or been aware of or been influenced by, what actually gets better? And I think that a lot of the insanity that is uh, is provoked, that is uh, thrown at us, all of these distracting events, one you know, one scarier than the next, are here to cover up the fact that the people who are currently in charge of managing the world, A, cannot do so, and B, to cover up the fact that nothing gets better by making things worse all the time. I, I read a paragraph that was just basically a very in-passing paragraph uh, written ahead of the August 1999 monthly horoscope. Planet waves are just going onto the internet in late 1998. We're coming up on 25 years, and I want to read you to I want to read you a paragraph that is just a, an acknowledgments paragraph. But check out the tone of of the writing. It's this black text against a beautiful green background. I want to offer my sincere thanks to all the people, including my colleagues, clients, students, and friends and in particular, Jonathan Kainer for his unfailing insight, optimism, and vision, who have worked with the light to create positive, expansive, and loving possibilities for our culture and for us as individuals during the approach of this stranger-than-life astrology. I wrote that just ahead of the August 11th, 1999 total solar eclipse in Leo. Um, we can hardly imagine thinking or feeling or saying such a thing now. And that is because so much negativity has taken over and the internet has become a whole different thing uh, than it was when it was started. Uh, so let's, uh, let's take off on that point. This is, uh, again, I was at that, at that moment writing uh, the, a series of articles that were related to this um, really important eclipse that took place in the summer of 1999, on, again, August 11th, 1999. And look, there was all the usual confrontation between good and evil, but there was, in the, in the, in the form particularly of uh, the Cassini space probe being shot past the Earth with 72 pounds of weapons-grade plutoniums to power its batteries... But there was something that we don't have now, which is any optimism, any sense of potential, possibility. And that is what eclipses are about. They are about letting go of the possibilities that you don't want and the life patterns that do not serve you. And though I realize this is never done all at once, the the, the essence of action in an eclipse is to move yourself in the direction that you want to go rather than thinking about moving yourself in the direction that you want to go. We've largely become mental beings who don't understand what it means to take action. That's because every action taken is either some form of online form, app, thing you click, uh, or some such. And I'm talking about really making some changes in your physical environment and in the pattern of your use of time. Pattern of your use of time. And the there is a wide orb of influence of the eclipse. If you're just hearing about this now, then now is the time to start. We still have six days to the solar eclipse, then a fa another 14 days into the lunar eclipse and the vortex is still open, but not for that long after the lunar eclipse. And so what I'm suggesting is use this time, these hours, these days, this week, these weeks, and, and this coming fortnight of the lunar cycle from solar eclipse to lunar eclipse uh, to direct your use of time, your energy, the decisions you make, in the direction that you want to go. Uh, eclipses represent a concentration of time. And so 
you, we are much closer to the fulcrum. It, it is easier to make the change at the fulcrum. The fulcrum is, uh, for example, let's say you're looking uh, through a telescope. The telescope is going to pivot on something. Uh, that that would be like, let's say it's on a tripod of some kind, and it's connected by some kind of adapter that holds the thing up but allows you to move it. You could move the telescope one millimeter at the fulcrum, but then it moves the vision through the lens, moves light years on the other side. And so right now, as these eclipses approach, we are much closer to a kind of uh, energetic and psychic fulcrum. So small moves mean much more than they would normally mean. It's just my view, my experience of, uh, of, of working with these events. So one of the things you want to do is emphasize what you want during the time of eclipses. Th there's always the possibility to neglect certain things. We do plenty of it at different times. And so if you have to neglect something you don't want in favor of what you want, that is the whole point. And that is a form of taking action, a form of shifting continuity, and a form of making decisions. So that is uh, that that is the energy of eclipses generally. Let's talk a little bit about the specifics of this one. It it takes place in Libra and over the past few weeks as I've been writing about there's been a lot of activation of the Aries Libra axis. The Aries Libra axis uh, includes Eris and Chiron sitting on the Aries and the north node sitting on the Chiron and at the moment Siva a uh, uh, an asteroid associated with sound it doesn't have the ominous properties of the Lord Shiva, but it is associated with hearing, with listening, and with sound. Okay, so uh, the eclipse takes place in Libra, and it is opposite the midpoint of Chiron and Eris. So the the eclipse is at twenty one and change. Chiron's at seventeen, and Eris is at twenty four. So though Chiron and Eris are opposite the eclipse, there's a midpoint lurking in Libra, and that's called the opposite midpoint of Chiron and of, uh, of, of Eris. And so what this is telling us is that there is, first of all, well, the eclipse is talking to these two slow-moving, ultra-slow-moving at the moment, planets. Second, uh, there is a conjunction coming in 2025 between Chiron and Eris. I really need to write these dates down and hang them on the wall uh, till I memorize them, but let's get a fix on the date of the first conjunction of Chiron and Eris, and let's aim for that. Aspects, Chiron, conjunct, Eris marking in the Long gone IO series program Sprite Chiron conjunct Eris is May 27th, 2025, in less than a year and a half. Now, that may seem like a long time from now, except that uh, it, is, it is not a long time, particularly given the fact that this eclipse, this sorry, this conjunction last happened in the early 1970s. Chiron conjunct Eris last happened in uh, 1971. In 1972, over a period of nine months from uh, February, no, that's 1918, May of 71, September of 71, March of 72, and now the subsequent one coming up is May of 2025. This is a highly provocative conjunction. It will have the effect of... Uh, well, it's really going to stir the pot, and it's going to stir the pot on the crisis of digital conditions that we are in, this crisis we are living through of disembodiment. Now, you may think, well, but I, I do a lot of yoga poses and all that. Well, yeah, you can still be disembodied and do all the yoga in you, you, you want, because disembodied is not just about the physical level. Disembodied means disconnecting the, the mind or consciousness from consequences on the physical plane. So it's not exactly about exercise other than 
recognizing that decisions have consequences and whether your mind is in the on position or the off position means a great deal. There's also uh, a provocation of identity politics, which we have been in for years. Uh, this has really been going on in, in an exaggerated and accelerated form since Trevon Martin uh, was killed. And that, you know, he, his, the, the person who killed him was acquitted by a jury. And, uh, and then there's been sort of one massive racial thing after the next. I think Trayvon Martin was where the Black Lives Matter movement had its genesis. And then this has moved into this uh, uh, obsession with sexual politics, trans politics, and this kind of hyperbolic, toxic feminism that is not good for men or for women. It is merely divisive. Anything that is divisive is not good for society. And by, by divisive, I mean simply outrages people where, where there is no concept of how we might resolve this. It's very important to look at problems that don't seem to have solutions as something other than problems. This is an old Yiddish statement. It probably has shown up in different cultures. If something does not have a solution, maybe it's not a problem. Now, this sounds like a, a kind of a, a clever axiom. I have actually found this to be true personally, but in all of these things that we're presented with publicly, where it's where whatever issue is hurled at us over and over and over again that does not have any solution or potential resolve, hmm, maybe it's not a problem. Maybe it means needs another name. Maybe it is just some kind of uh, terrorism, for example. Okay, so uh, slightly off topic there, but influenced by uh, all the aforementioned discussion of astrology. Where was I? I was on, ah, I was on the conjunction of Chiron and Eris in Aries. So while this happens in 2025, we've been influenced by this for a long time. And in just remember that identity politics are very appealing, but they are largely a competition for who is the victim of the month or who is the biggest victim. No one will ever become enlightened by falling for that and taking that at face value. You might become enlightened questioning it. You might become enlightened uh, attempting to solve something and then realizing that it, it's not possible that the, and, and shifting the entire discussion. But just taking that at face value uh, Right. Okay. Now, um, let's talk about a few specifics in the astrology. Uh, first of all, Mars is now in Scorpio, uh, and that is deepening the passion and sense of urgency of, uh, of certain matters. Uh, Mars is joining Ceres in Scorpio, so Ceres already brings a deep emotional level uh, to Scorpio, kind of focusing and, um, you know, making uh, Scorpio kind of come to life in a way. Uh, there's another point there called Apollon. It's a hypothetical point, and that is, uh, that, that is about commerce and trade. And so uh, what we're seeing with Apollon in Scorpio is that basically uh, it is very difficult to sell something unless you trigger people in some way. Okay, so uh, Ceres is in an aspect. Uh, Ceres is not really talked about very much by astrology. It's often misunderstood. Uh, it is, however, directly connected to the, the process of grieving and of, of grieving loss and of acknowledging loss. And one of the reasons why the world just seems to keep getting worse is one thing happens after the next, and there is so rarely the acknowledgement of loss. There's so rarely the mere admission of grief. There's anger. Of course, what's going on between Israel and Hamas right now is outrageous, whatever you think it's happening. But the 
the anger is largely a cover for grief. It's easier to be angry. Um, it also has a way of just kind of slipping deeper into the, into the psyche uh, and, and never really being available to resolve. And yet we're conditioned over and over again to be angry and to think that anger is not only the right, uh, the, the right approach, but also the only reasonable approach. So Ceres is opposite Jupiter right now and is for the eclipse. And so this is an exaggeration uh, of some facet of grief. And what I'm, what I'm saying is uh, we need to take this deeper. Also during this event is Mercury opposite Chiron. Now all contacts between Mercury and Chiron have this sense of not being smart enough. The, the kid in school, maybe it was you, who was always a little bit behind the class and who didn't understand the things the teacher said and thought that it was because you were stupid, not because the teacher was not teaching them in an effective way, probably had some kind of a Mercury-Chiron contact. Mercury-Chiron contacts are not in the charts of the people who seem smart in class. They're, the, they're in the charts of the people who sit in the back of the room and who think differently, who think unlike other people, who need to learn at their own pace and in their own way, generally self-directed. There's a real independence to anything uh, involving Chiron. And with Mercury, that's going to be uh, an independence of mind. Uh, so... One of the things that is, uh, and sorry if there's some banging in the background, they're installing carpeting out in the corridor outside my apartment. So I'm just going to pretend to not hear that and hope it's not coming up uh, too loud. Okay, so we've only got a few minutes left uh, to, to this uh, particular podcast. As I uh, approach uh, elderhood, now for my second stage of elderhood, Chiron return first and then uh, Saturn return earlier this year, the... The thing that troubles me the most about the human race is its insistence on uh, playing the game of stupidity. And what I have found is that this is not really about stupidity. Usually, given the opportunity, people will think things through. They are almost all capable of thinking things through, but there is a real laziness of thought and a kind of a don't make me think too hard quality. Uh, that, that has become endemic in contemporary consciousness. Uh, people, uh, go, you know, they're going from, oh, I'm, I'm such a smarty pants at the front of the class to, nope, I'm a dumbass. It's not cool to be smart. But the thing that it's not when you're smart is it, it is not really possible that you can be lazy about your observations and your conclusions, but rather... It's just easier to follow along with what people say. So Mercury is in Libra, and, uh, and Chiron is in Aries. And so this is really encouragement to kind of buck up and think for yourself. And if you're thinking for yourself and that leads you to understand that the other ways you were thinking, thought you were thinking for yourself or going along with all the bullshit were wrong and you have to rethink, all right, that's a perfect example of, uh, of Mercury and Chiron. The thing is, isn't the re may be an exaggeration. Uh, it may not be about rethinking anything, but merely let's think. Okay, so um, one other aspect, and probably be a couple of more uh, in this chart is there is an exact trine of Venus and Pholus. Uh, that is uh, that is also there's a lot going on in early Capricorn where Pholus is. Uh, so it is really Venus trine the early Capricorn group of Pholus, uh, Cupido, Quayar, and Ixion, all kinds of deep family stuff going on there. The Venus trine is a kind of a tap into that. It's just kind of opening up that energy. And to me, 
when folus is involved in something, that is an acceleration. And with Venus in Virgo, we're talking about an acceleration of integrating various facets of thought, of mind, and of body, uh, and actually being able to, uh, you know, uh, pat your head and rub your tummy at the same time, or walk and chew gum, and that being thinking and feeling at the same time. This is my special report so far for the October 14th annular eclipse of the sun uh, in the sign Libra. I am planning to be back later today with Journey Without Distance, the Course in Miracles podcast. And my chosen topic for today is sex and A Course in Miracles. Thanks for listening. Thank you for supporting Planet Waves. Stay in touch.